we now talk about the development environment that can be used for developing projects on for an embedded system so when we look at the development environment for an embedded system project we look at two aspects the development processor and the target processor what is the development processor the processor on which we write and debug our programs <coughs> which is usually a pc so a personal computer would always be a development processor and what is the target processor the processor that the program will run on in our embedded system so this is our target processor which might be a microcontroller which might be any other a uh, processor different from the development processor for which we are writing a program that would be a target processor for example if we are using a microcontroller so microcontroller is going to be a target processor so you would always develop on the development processor so now let's look a little up uh, take a look at the software development process <coughs> so for software development process we usually use compilers and compilers are typically called cross compilers why are they called cross compilers they are running on the one processor but generating code for another processor so what what would happen basically the cross compiler would run on the development processor but the cross compiler would produce the output for the target processor that is what do we mean by this of course we can have the assemblers linkers debuggers and profilers profilers is a very good tool which can give you performance information about the performance of a program <coughs> so we can analyze different sections of the code and we can find out the run time for those sections and we can find out this by comparison the run times of the different sections of code and we can then make a assumption about the slow parts or slow portions of the code so that slow portion of the code could be coded in assembly language to increase the performance the profiler would, would give us information about the slow sections of the code so that we can code the slow sections using the assembly language now this diagram is a very good diagram it gives us basically the discussion or the aspects of how we can do uh, the assembly language interfacing right so if we if we use a profiler and we find the slow portions of the code so we would want to code those slow portions in assembly language usually there's a catch we would first try to code recode the slow portion in the same language again remember remember my discussion about the algorithm optimization so we'll try to optimize those lines in the c language for example if we are writing the code in c language or c++ language if we cannot achieve performance in c c++ language by rewriting the slow portion of the code we would definitely resort to coding all the slow portions of the code in assembly language this is called assembly language interfacing assembly language interfacing <coughs> So basically how do we do assembly language interfacing there are two approaches basically if we are using the c slash c++ environment right so one of them being that we have a c file module we have another c file module and we have an assembly file module with the extension asm so what do we do we compile all the c modules using a c compiler into the respective binary files or the obj files or which are also called object files so we create two object files for example one corresponding to this code and the other corresponding to this code 
Similarly, we assemble our assembly language file using an assembler into a third OBJ file. So after this step, we have three OB OBJ files, two OBJ files for the C coding and one OBJ file for the assembly coding. Then we input these OBJ files to the linker, right? Linker accepts all the object files, links them together to create an executable file. Well, linker might also access some external libraries which are referred to in the these binary files. So linker uses the OBJ files and the library files to generate the final executable file. <coughs> So this is one approach that is used for long assembly language programs in which the section to be coded in assembly language or in other words the slow portion of the code is a lot, right? Many times we have, sm so we have small portions of slow code which need to be translated to assembly language. So in C++ or C we have this really nice option of inline assembly as it is called. Sorry about that. Inline. And what do we mean by inline? You can have a C program void main, for example. This is our C program which is continuing. So, in the middle of the C program only. <coughs> we use the directive ASM which tells the compiler that all lines after this directive would be assembly code. So we write the full assembly code that we want after this ASM directive and when we are done we close the assembly portion by using the end ASM directive. So automatically we don't need to create se uh, separate ASM files in this approach. So assembly portion is just encoded using the ASM directive and end ASM directive. So it is very easy and quick for assembly language interfacing. But this approach is suitable for a large section of the code if it needs to be interfaced with the C language program. Nevertheless, we can use this approach to implement a complex assembly language coding as well, but we use it to in, uh, for quick and fast interface with assembly language and for more section of the code, we can use this first approach. After developing the program, we go to steps to run the program and for running this program for the target processor. We have different approaches. If the development process is different than target, how do we run our compiled code? So we have two options. We can download the code to the target processor or we can simulate the code. Well, downloading to the target processor has got many pictures and many forms, right? This can have many approaches. One of them being is to use a device programmer device programmer is a universal device in which you place your target processor programs the processor and then you can put that processor in your target device on a breadboard and then you can find out how the program is running so the first approach is have to have a device programmer. Secondly, we can have in circuit programming. And by in circuit we mean that we don't remove the target processor from the PCB, right? 
so we might be having a pcb and we might be having the target processor in the pcb so if you, if you are using the device programmer we would take this target processor out of the system and plug it into the programmer and then program once we have programmed it in the programmer we place the target processor back into the pcb and check it in circuit is more flexible you don't need to remove the target processor from the pcb you let the target processor remain in the pcb this is our pcb and you can connect the in circuit programmer into the pcb and program the processor while it is in circuit so hence the term in circuit serial programming so basically atmel uses the concept of isp in circuit serial programming that is atmel's notation atmel is the company that produces uh, popular microcontrollers and when we talk about microchip they have, they call it icsp so icsp is the term used by microchip in circuit serial programming they refer to one and the same things but these are different terminologies used by atmel and microchip respectively so after the second approach there is also a third approach and third approach is basically called as a bootloader now bootloader is uh, can be seen as an extension of approach number 2 you let the device remain in the pcb in which your target processor is going to be working you transfer your code from the pc to your pcb via any via any serial link and there's a program that is called as bootloader that is running inside the target processor so the bootloader that is running inside the target processor accepts your program and programs the device so what are the popular examples of bootloaders arduino arduino is an excellent example of a bootloader so bootloader is even a more simplified approach as compared to in circuit serial programming because using bootloaders you can use the normal interfaces like usb to transfer your code from the pc pc to the pcb which houses your target processor now one important point to note is that in order for the bootloader to work the target processor must support what is called as self programming so your target processor must support the self programming and what do we mean by self programming self programming means that the target processor that is over here has the ability to program its memory based on certain instructions which are called self programming instructions so we can say that bootloaders would be supported only in the target processors that support self programming instructions so examples are all atmel based uh, arduino based uh, microcontrollers that support the bootloader concept by supporting self programming now we have this instruction set simulator for a simple processor this just gives an idea of how the iss would actually be written right so we have a structure the name of the structure is instruction is consist of the character first byte and second byte right so program mem instruction memory is defined in terms of the structure instruction it consists of 1024 instructions right and then we have the inside character 256 character area that is basically the data memory So now we execute void run underscore program. 
where this is the size of the program number of bytes right so we we increment the program counter first because initially it was at minus 1 so we go to this, the second one sorry the zeroth location now and we continue till we have this number of byte number underscore bytes divided by 2 because instruction words consist of 2 bytes then we in the first byte and the second byte by using this format we right shift the first byte by 4 bits so that the opcode comes to the LSBs to the least significant nibble of this particular <coughs> F first byte and then we make decisions based on the opcode so this is basically what we are having so if this if this uh, is 0 we execute this particular operation right this this if the answer is 1 we execute this particular opcode answer is 2 this particular opcode right and so on and so forth and there is also can you see case number 6 it is interesting in case number 6 we are adding the second byte to the program counter so what is case number 6 it is a branch instruction good then of course we return from this main thing so then we have this main function right in which we read the instructions or the executable file as you might say right and then of course we uh, execute this if loop right after the program has been run we can print the memory contents as well but if there's something error in this we return minus one indicating that the program could not run there might be several errors there might be a file not existing or memory full whatever so this is a simple example 